Yo, what's good, Epic7 fam? Pat here, back with another video. It's been a bit. I kind of wanted to de-stress after my performance at the Orbis Caster Clash. I do want to thank a lot of you guys who supported me, gave me your kind words. Does mean a lot to me. Uh, after I was ready to get back on the content grind, uh, Mother Nature decided spring was in full swing, and I just kind of died from allergies for like the last week or so. Um, my eyelids had just swollen up. I couldn't really see straight. Uh, I was sneezing everywhere. It was absolutely miserable. I'm on a bunch of allergy meds now. Uh, it, hopefully, it's uh, you know, it'll be working a bit better. I feel better, but you can kind of probably hear the congestion still in me. I'm not gonna let that try to slow me down anymore. I'm gonna be releasing a slew of content coming up tomorrow. We have the return of Advent, so if there's any necessary updates, I'll have that as well. I should also have another How to Play on Yulha available at some point, but the main reason you are all probably here is to hear my thoughts on the custom group summons, which will also be making a return tomorrow on April 20th, which is, uh, you know, kind of a Kind of a day <laughs> that uh, a lot of people talk about. I personally will be spending it watching Lil Wayne with the Street Fighter 6 reveals. Hopefully, whatever you decide to do, it is um, uh, family friendly. <laughs> Let's say that. Uh, but yeah, you're probably here for my thoughts on the custom group summons here. Much like I did the update with the custom mystic summons, it'll be of the same format. I've talked at length about a lot of these characters in other videos. I'm going to try and keep this short and to the point. Just talk about the characters and most importantly, the artifacts accompanying the characters because that heavily influences the decision of how I've rated these characters. I spend about 20 to 30 seconds each on them before moving on to explaining why you'd want to take one over the other. Really important, if you are a newer player and I signify a character as limited and you do not have it, you should pick it up because it's better to have access to the entire roster first and foremost, especially if those characters ever get a buff. Usually when a character that's limited gets a buff, they do do a banner rerun, but that has not always been the case. Landy is the most famous example where she was absolutely terrible. They buffed her. And then for like six to seven months, she never came back and she was a dominating force in the meta. So if you don't have limited characters, probably should choose them. I have weighted the limited characters a bit higher, so you will see them in the higher tiers in the first place. So do keep that in mind. Let's go over the tiers really quickly so I can kind of explain to you why that they are where they are. Top tier is going to be godlike character and or artifact. These are basically the meta characters or they contain an artifact that is super super good like really good defining for that character's entire archetype things like that their class like probably the best artifact in their class for example right so that's why these characters are the way they are also do note even though you see a character like politis in the top left i have just organized all the characters by color i rate all the characters in the same tier roughly equal next is great character or artifact that you want lots of copies of self-explanatory pretty good character somewhere in the game or they have an artifact that you're going to want to have multiple copies of so for all of your characters or you're going to want to have a very high rated one like a plus 31 or if you're just a big spender yeah and yeah obviously you're going to want to have a lot of plus 30 copies of the artifacts that these characters have next up is good character or a artifact that you may want these are playable characters but like they might have less artifact value or the characters are just not as good as the characters above Niche character or artifact is the fourth tier. These are characters that have some use somewhere or they have a best in slot artifact for somebody, but it's not necessarily that many people. Like maybe only one character, for example, can really use their artifact, but like that character absolutely needs that artifact to be super successful. Don't pull is self-explanatory. And the last tier is not available as far as I know, because as far as I'm aware, you can't choose characters that have come out in the last six months and you cannot choose limiteds that have not had a rerun yet. So I'm fairly certain that these are the four that you will not be able to talk about. But again, it is as far as I know, I will still talk about these characters and where I would actually rate them if I could actually rate them. Okay, with that out of the way, Let's jump into the actual list now. Let's start this list off with Politis. Politis, since the most recent balance patch, is just very, very good. She's already been good, but now I think she's exceptionally good, whether you are a fast player or a slow player. Fast players, you already know, full damage, ancient book, which is one of the best artifacts in the game. 
And then now for the turn two players, you can play at like 250 plus speed, Abyssal Crown, ton of effectiveness to punish aggressive drafts with Ahmed. No matter what your play style is, you really need to have a Politus built in your uh, roster and your wings for World Arena. And honestly, I have two. She's that good where having both versions of her is super, super important, I feel like. So even if you already have her, she's definitely one you might want to consider picking up. Her accompanying artifact, Knowledge Seed, I think is one of the worst in the entire game. So that's not really the reason you're picking her. Next up is Red Robbie. Still a solid bruiser in World Arena. Provides good imprints for Apocalypse Ravi. Main reason you're choosing her is because her accompanying artifact is Sigurd Scythe, which is one of the best warrior artifacts in the entire game. Many of the competitive warriors in the game currently, like Lone Crescent Bologna and even Edward Ulrich, really want to have Sigurd Scythe. Next up is Charlotte. Very similar story to Red Ravi. Good 4-5 pick, especially if your opponent has something like Spectre Tenebria plus Landy as the damage dealers in their World Arena draft. Main reason you are choosing Charlotte is because her accompanying artifact is Elbrus Ritual Sword, which is one of the absolute best ones in the entire game for a knight. I have two plus 30 Elbrus Ritual Swords, and I still want more. It is that important of an artifact to have. Next up, Tamarin, PvE Goddess. If you are a newer player and don't have this character, or you just haven't cleared all the content in the game and don't have Tamarin yet, you really need to pick her up. She's that important for Abyss, Adventure, Raid, you name it, she just does it all, the best PvE character in the entire game. Her accompanying artifact is Idol's Cheer, which is a solid build around option if you're looking for something like that. Moving on here to the first blue character and our first limited on the list, it is Cerise. Cerise is not super great in PvP currently at the moment, but she is still finding a home in things like Abyss and Expedition, so she does have some inherent value there. The main reason you are choosing her is because of her limited artifact, Guiding Light. There are three artifacts, in my opinion, that are the pillars of competitive Epic 7 currently. The first is Tagahel's Ancient Book, which is for mages and a four-star. Arius, which is a knight artifact for four stars, and again, both of those are super accessible. The third one is Guiding Light, which is a five-star limited one, and pretty much defines the ranger class at high levels in PvP. I currently have four copies of Guiding Light. I still need more copies of Guiding Light. It is that strong. It is borderline busted. And until they nerf it or they give us some kind of suitable answer besides just Milam, it's going to continue to be that way long into the future. So as more Rangers come out, you're going to need more copies of Guiding Light. This is definitely one of the highest priority picks, I think, on the entire list if you're serious about PvP. Next up is Fairy Tale Tenebria another limited character she is a decent debuffer in the four five slot absolutely still viable at high level pvp her imprints are very great for specter tanabria as well so you get a top tier imprint for choosing this character she also has a limited artifact in fairy tale for a nightmare which is a best in slot option for some mage damage dealers like archdemon shadow as well as aria next up we have lua who is the most pre-banned pvp character as of the last season and one of the dominating forces in pretty much every facet of PvP. As long as she's not banned, she's absolutely busted. Even with the buff to Lilius to kind of hard counter, I still think she's probably the best PvP character in the game, which is why she lands on this spot. Spatio-Temporal Fan, her accompanying artifact, is a solid option for her, but I probably would still choose Guiding Light. Next up, we have Shu. Absolute staple, turn two bruiser, and a core of some of the game's best Guild War defenses. Just all around, very tanky, high damage bruiser. Really, really good for slower playstyles. Her accompanying artifact is Snow Crystal, which is super synergistic and one of the best options you can play on her. Next up, we have Landy, who is another just staple limited unit. Just like Spectre 10 and Bria, I feel like Landy is evergreen. She's going to almost always be relevant. The Zodiac Cup that just happened recently, Landy showed up in force and showed she is still a very, very strong PvP character. On top of that, one of the best Expedition characters in the game, one of the best Abyss characters in the game, one of the best Raid characters in the game. Landy just does it all. She's one of the best characters in, in all of Epic 7. Her accompanying artifact is Wall of Order, which is limited, but not exactly the best. It's really only played on characters like Briar Witch Asseria if you need the damage, or Operator Segret if you, again, need the damage. Moving on, we have another turn two staple unit, Insane. 
arguably the best green bruiser in all of Epic 7. Dragon Slayer Strike, her S3, locks down entire teams, and she can win entire matches by herself. Definitely a character you're going to want to have built if you are, are afraid of very fast or very aggressive drafts in World Arena. Staple character for Guild War defenses as well. Main reason that she is here is because her accompanying artifact, Spear of a New Dawn, you really need to have six copies of to get it to that plus 30 level. So you're going to want to pull a this character a lot. Great character, e arguably even better artifact. You really need that thing maxed out to make this character really pop off and be as good as she can possibly be. Next up, we have Destina. Probably the second best or best soul weaver in the game certainly like the second best cleanser we have in the format debuffs are super prevalent in pvp destina is a core in a lot of guild war offenses currently and again one of the best world arena characters you could pick she does it all she heals revives cleanses just absolute staple support character if you're serious about pvp her accompanying artifact shamadra staff is decent for her, but I find it's a little bit better on certain other characters, such as Maid Chloe. Certainly a viable artifact. Next up, we have Rowana, who kind of falls under the same category of Tamarin. If you don't have Rowana, you kind of really need her. She cheeses a lot of boss fights in the game in PvE. She's good in Expeditions, and she auto-wins a lot of matchups in PvP as well, especially on Guild War offense. So even if you don't really dip your toes into World Arena, Rowana's just one of those characters that you always really need to actually have. She doesn't have the, you know, super high gear requirements. So even like newbies can build her, just slap that 75 uh, level 75 health set on her. You'll do super fine. Her accompanying artifact is Touch of Rekos, which is okay, but it's not exactly the best. You just really want to make sure you have one copy of Rwana, no matter what kind of player you actually are. Lastly, in this category here is going to be Aseria. Aseria is a staple PvE unit, very good for hunts, raids, uh, abyss, you name it. She's just one of those characters you always want to have in the wings for any sort of PvE content. Pairs incredibly well with Tamarin. Her accompanying artifact is Song of Stars, which is another PvE all-star. It's what makes certain hunt one-shots possible. It's what allows certain expeditions to pop off without a hitch. It's what makes certain dagger Sakar quests super easy to actually clear. So again, if you're a serious PvE player, the series is definitely one of the best ones you can choose. Next up, we have great character and or artifacts that you're going to want to have a lot of copies of. The first one here is Summertime Aseria, who you could make a case for should be in the godlike character or artifact section. The thing is that her artifact, which is going to be uh, Star of the Deep Sea, it's very good on her. It's very good on Pirate Captain Flan. You're going to want to have it plus 30 and you're going to want to have probably two copies, one for her and one for Flan. But outside of that, nobody else really uses the artifact. And while Asaria is still a good PvP character, she's not nearly as insane as she used to be. She's kind of like a last pick character. It's like a gimmick, I feel like, in certain aggressive drafts. And you could certainly see her sometimes on Guild War defenses. But again, while great, not as good as she used to be. And the artifact, while insane on herself and Flan, again, those are only the only real two characters that can take advantage of it. So that's why I decided to move her a bit lower. Next up is Kron, staple character to have built if you are trying to have some kind of anti-aggression package. You usually pick him in like the 4-5 slot against Cleave or aggro drafts to see if you can get a free win. So definitely a viable character, not the best, but still viable. His accompanying artifact is Shepherd of the Hollow, which is arguably one of the best artifacts in the game for so many characters. It's great for Remnant Violet. It's great for Savior Auden. It's great for Closer Charles. There are just a lot of characters that could really take advantage of his artifact, and I'm sure in the future there'll be even more that can actually take advantage of his artifact. Next up is Holiday Euphine, another limited character. A lot of higher level players have had success with her as kind of a pocket pick, but it's never really panned out for me. I just guess I can't get it to work. So my opinion of this character is a bit lower, but I know that there are people out there that do consider this character very, very good. Uh, your mileage may vary. It's not super uh, my cup of tea, though. I don't really recommend it for the character. I recommend it, though, for the artifact, which is Champion's Trophy, which is an excellent warrior artifact, if, especially if you're playing a control warrior. Uh, characters like Judge Kise, 
uh, conquer Alilius. Even like Mui can really take advantage of it. And then obviously Euphine herself can. I just think that the artifact is absolutely incredible. And if there's other, you know, control warriors that come out in the future, I definitely think you're going to want to have a copy of it. Again, this is a really weird one for me to evaluate because depending on who you ask, this character is either going to be higher than I have her or going to be lower than when I have her. But I think I put her in this spot because again, I think champion's trophy just really is that good. Next up is Dn. Another limited unit, which is why uh, she's here. I feel like Dn has kind of fallen out of favor a little bit. There's a lot of things that really like destroy her. Ikarina is running around everywhere. Doesn't really care about her critical hit resist. Sanya is also very prevalent. Doesn't care about critical hit resist. Lone Crescent Bologna is also very common. Doesn't care about critical hit resist. So Dn is just not as good, I feel like, for the slower turn two drafts as she used to be. For aggressive players, there's Ahmed. Still a Solid character, though, in PvP. Like, not unplayable, right? And still has her home and usage in things like Abyss. So, again, not the worst character. Her accompanying artifact, Unfading Memories, has seen, since it's buff, a lot more play. It is usable on certain characters like Amelia, for example. And you're going to want to get that thing maxed out, if you can, to get the most amount of healing out of it. So, yeah, definitely still worth picking. Just not as good as she used to be in the past. Next up is one of my favorite characters in Luna, another fan favorite and limited character. Luna has, you know, had some rough times lately as far as PvP goes. Still somewhat viable in World Arena as like a last pick with Command Model Leica, but it's not really meta. It's more of a copium thing. You could use it if you really wanted to. You could obviously still Luna cleave people in things like Guild Wars or even regular Arena, but... If we're being honest, like she definitely feels like a mid to low tier character right now. The main reason you're choosing her is her accompanying artifact is Draco Plate, which like Sigurd Scythe is a staple for a lot of warriors in the game. Sigurd Scythe feels like it's a bit more favored now and you want more copies of that than Draco Plate. I find that there are more alternatives to Draco Plate, but the characters that really want Sigurd Scythe really want Sigurd Scythe and there's not really any other alternative. So while Draco Plate is probably the best option, there are similar alternatives there's no real alternative for Sigurd Scythe which is why I put Robbie above Luna next up is Arya a character I have recently made a guide for the main reason why Arya is here is because she is a fantastic last pick in a lot of drafts in World Arena and there are also some Guild War offense uh, strategies you can employ with her that make her very very good this is a character that you want to pull a lot of copies of because she really wants imprints because she's that stat hungry. And then also her own accompanying artifact, Scroll of Shadows, is fantastic on her. But you're going to want to have a lot of copies on her. So that's why Arya landed here as opposed to, say, lower on the list. Next up, we have Ran, fastest character in the game. Still really strong if you have a lot of speed gear. You can even not necessarily pick him as an opener. He's traditionally great as an opener. But you can pick them in the 4 or 5 slot with a bunch of speed gear and damage and just kind of have like a pocket cleave strategy. So still very, very strong character. His accompanying artifact, which I believe is the uh, Sword of Winter, is not exactly the best, but it's not exactly the worst. You're primarily picking Rand because he's just a really strong character. He even has some PvE usage now in Nightmare Raid. Next up, we have Sigret here. Sigret is largely only here for newer players. If you are a newer player, as far as I'm aware, people have informed me that the Awakening update free five stars have gone away at this point. And if that's true, Sigret is pretty much the best uh, Wyvern character you can choose as a newer player. She will help skyrocket your progress throughout the game. So if you do not have Sigret and Sigret is not a freely available option anymore for you, then I think you need to pick up Sigret. She's really important for you newer players who really haven't ironed out your Wyvern 13 teams yet because that's super important to the long-term uh, progress of your actual account. Her accompanying artifact, which is Cradle of Life, not exactly super great. So you're only really choosing her if you need the character for getting your Wyvern 13 team started. Similar story here with Vivian, although she is a bit better. Vivian also used to be freely available for new players, but I do not think she is available anymore, at least if my information uh, that people have fed me is correct. So Vivian is arguably the best hunt character 
in the entire game for newer players until you get a one shot kind of up and running. She's great in Golem. She's great in Banshee. She is great in Azimatic. She's super good there. She also has some usage in some other PVE game modes like Advent. She's super great in. She's good in some Abyss Floor. So uh, really, really strong PVE character. Uh, one that I think that almost every account should have access to because it does make your progress again a lot faster like with Sigret. I think she's a little bit better than Sigret because she's more multifaceted. You could use her in more places. Her accompanying artifact, Dignosaur, is super important for her in order to set up some specific one-shot compositions. So yeah, again, pretty good character to choose as a newer player if you're looking to kind of jumpstart the progress of your account. Next up is uh, Basar Allen, the former fastest mage alive. Basar, as a character, absolutely has fallen on hard times. I don't recommend pulling for him for the character. He's pretty much just Desert Jewel Basar imprints at this point. He's just not fast enough, I feel like, for a mage to be super viable. Watch this video age like Sour Milk and he ends up kind of making a resurgence after I make it. The primary reason you're choosing Basar is his accompanying artifact is Abyssal Crown, which is pretty much like Sigurd Scythe <laughs> for Warriors. It's one of the best mage artifacts in the game. It's probably the second best mage artifact in the entire game behind Ancient Book. You're going to want to have as many copies as possible for this thing because there's so many strong control strategies like Politus wants this thing. Uh, you have Solitary of the Snow could want this thing. Sage Ball and Cezanne could want this thing. There are definitely a lot of competitively viable characters that really want to have a plus 30 Abyssal Crown. And if you find yourself lacking and needing more Abyssal Crowns, then absolutely choose Basar. Next up is Vildred. Excellent PvE character for Hunts. Excellent character for Abyss. Also one of the most important characters for PvP because he has one of the most desirable things in the game in a speed imprint. Having a bunch of copies of Vildred invested into one another to have that triple S speed imprint can win you games in World Arena. Super, super important. Another thing that's super awesome about him is that a viable build for his PvP also works in PvE, so he's incredibly flexible. His accompanying artifact, Sword of Summer Twilight, is also incredibly good on him and even a character like Rand. So if you're a super aggressive player, I think you have to have a triple S imprint Vildred and getting extra copies of his artifact can definitely help as well. Next up, we have Alencia, another staple green bruiser, just like with Senya. The thing is, I think that Alencia is a little bit worse than Senya is currently, even though she's still, I think, an amazing, amazing bruiser. The other thing that kind of has her down here lower than actually Senya is that her accompanying artifact, Alencinox's Wrath, really isn't as good as, you know, Spear of a New Dawn is for Senya. There's definitely other viable options than Alencinox's Wrath. You could choose things like Full Metal Auto Mail if you have it, and a slew of other warrior artifacts. I personally still play Alencinox's Wrath on Alencia, but... Again, it's not the only option, which is why I have her a bit lower. If you're serious about, you know, Guild War offense or World Arena in general, and you are a slower bruiser style player, a tank down player, you definitely want to make sure you have Alencia in your wings. Next up, we have Celine. Celine made a pretty big resurgence in the Zodiac Cup over the last weekend. Kind of proved that she's not really the meme character people think she is. I personally... Still have a gripe with the character because she has arguably the worst base stats, in my opinion, for any thief in the game. And I think that really holds her back from greatness and makes it so that she's not as good as a character like Politus. But again, that tournament showing showed that she is still a character you should have geared if you are serious about World Arena. Just super good into non-attack skill characters. Her accompanying artifact, Storm Sword, is insane on her and has other applications as well we saw in the zodiac cup there was a speed based remnant violet on storm sword that absolutely just popped off so that is definitely something you could do also really good on her ml counterpart spirit isolate so yeah storm sword is one that you're gonna want to have a lot of copies at plus 30 if you can get it because it enables some very very cool and very powerful strategies Moving on to our next category, which is the good characters or artifacts you may want. 
we will start it off with one of my favorite characters in the game in Sermia. Sermia is very similar to Sigret and Vivian in that she's just really strong in PvE. One of the strongest PvE characters in the game. Great in Abyss, arguably the best damage dealer in the game in Hall of Trials, and is also very good in Expedition. Her artifact, which is going to be Border Coin, is also good, but it's a little bit niche. Uh, Sermia, again, strong, but not you know, widely played in a huge variety of game modes, no real PvP application. And Border Coin, while great, is only really used on like two or three characters. So that's kind of why I decided to stick her here. Next up is Red Cecilia, the best expedition character probably in the game. If you've watched How to Play Cecilia for me, you know I think this character is criminally underplayed. I don't understand why more people don't try to play this character. In PvP, I guess she's just not strong enough compared to other knights in the format, but strips, slows, full immunity, full team uh, uh, provoke, defense break, the character does pretty much everything you could want. She is the best PvE knight in the game aside from Raz, and she's still very, very close in that aspect. Her accompanying artifact is Rise of a Monarch, which does have PvP applications. You see characters like Last Rider Crowd playing it right now. So solid banner. If you don't have her, you're more PvE focused, especially for a newer player. Again, Cecilia, invaluable for expeditions. Next up, we have Lilius, who recently got a rework. I think this character is actually quite good, but how good remains to be seen. Uh, I don't really think you need duplicates of her, which is why I didn't put her higher. You only really need one copy of her. And her accompanying artifact, which is Bastion of Perlusia, is decent, but in my opinion, there's a lot better mage artifacts, which is why I decided to settle on her here. If you don't have her after her rework, I do think that she is worth it and definitely somebody you're going to want to have geared for World Arena. Another character that got a buff recently is Illinan. I am not 100% sure how strong Illinav is because I haven't really been able to play too much World Arena lately, but I do think that this character is quite strong, uh, but I don't think you need like a ton of copies of her. Yes, it would help because it gives her extra critical hit chance, but she's not as insane as getting like multiple copies of Arya, for example, and her accompanying artifact, which is going to be, I believe, Light and Shadow, uh, is pretty bad and in desperate need of a rework. So... The artifact I can't recommend. The jury's still out on whether or not the character is actually as good as I think she is. Um, and dupes are nice, but not exactly the best. That's why she ended up landing here. Next up is Kawerik, aka Red Hand Guy. Uh, very hard unit to use. Needs some really, really good gear, which is why I have him here. I don't think he's a bad character. He actually is a great character, not necessarily just a good character. Just most people watching, uh, I don't really think you're going to have the gear. Uh, necessary to really push this character and make him as good as you can get him. His accompanying uh, artifact, Black Hand of the Goddess, is actually a pretty solid mage artifact, not only on himself, but characters like Top Model Lulica, or, you know, just really, really good, even decent on something like Zeo, if you really wanted to. It's probably like a distant third or fourth, but you could definitely play it. There are applications for his artifact, and you would want a couple of copies of it, but I just don't think it's as good as some of the other characters that we've talked about already. Next up, we have Krow, who kind of isn't exactly in the best spot, in my opinion. He used to be the, like, all-around knight, the non-limited, non-ML knight. He was just super good. Then we got all these crazy good specialty change knights, which kind of has diminished his value quite a bit. And then also, who will be talking about in the same section, Yulha came out, who pretty much is a more aggressive version of of Krowl. So it's kind of like he's not exactly the only character with his identity anymore. Still a solid tank. Starting to see a lot more play because he's super good into his Moonlight 5 counterpart, Last Rider Krowl. So if you're looking for a counter to Last Rider Krowl, then Blue Krowl could be that character for you if you do not have him. His accompanying artifact is Holy Sacrifice, which, you know, it makes a resurgence every now and then. It is definitely a trick that your opponent might not see coming. Ken's absolutely steal you games. Decent on Guild War defense. I've seen people use it on un by Unbound Knight Arwell to some success. Uh, Troublemaker crows it to give you longevity against Cleave. So it's definitely a good artifact. And you're going to want to, at some point, have at least one plus 30 copy of Holy Sacrifice in your roster. So that's definitely another reason to consider it. Next up is Blue Kisei. Very, very powerful 
uh, aggressive damage dealer. You don't need to be crazy fast on this character. Like a lot of people are playing her like 270, 280. If you play her between like 250 and 260 speed right now with a ton of damage, that's probably still fine. Absolutely stellar damage dealer. I think her stocks are only going to rise in this format because she is actually fairly good into Last Rider Crow. Um, so I definitely think stocks are going to be on the rise for this character. The reason I didn't put her higher is because her company uh, artifact, Alabastron, it's kind of bad. There's very few, if any, users for it. So you don't really get a whole heck of a lot of value. You basically just choose Kisei because it's a strong damage dealer and she's waifu AF. Speaking of waifu AF, we have Etta, another very powerful, aggressive PvP character. More of a 4-5 pick than she has been before. If you're a cleave specialist or a very aggressive player, definitely somebody you're going to want to have uh, waiting in the wings. Her accompanying artifact is not exactly super great. I don't really know of anyone that can actually really take advantage of it. Since Ed is reworked, that artifact has just kind of not really had a home. You're better off just sticking with something like Ancient Book so you can get the Soul Burn combo and get max value out of the character. Next up is Elena. Fairly good uh, anti-control, anti-AOE, anti-aggressive character. Very niche, but the time she's good, she is very good. You're going to need really high effect resistance gear, I think, to really bring out the full potential in the character. The accompanying artifact, which is Stella Harpa, is incredible on characters like Rowana versus certain other characters like Archdemon Shadow. Her Stella Harpa in the right scenarios on the right characters really can just clinch games i think i probably value that artifact a bit higher so if you're not super keen on elena uh you're not really feeling her whole vibe i could definitely see why people might want to rate her a bit lower but i still think the character is fairly solid and again artifact fairly solid next up is violet staple anti blue character if your opponent has drafted like two blue dps and something else you can just ban out that last one take violet it's a force ban he just kind of auto wins. You don't really need a whole lot on him. Just give him a bunch of HP, a bunch of attack, 85% critical hit chance. Doesn't even need a ton of critical hit damage. He plays basically play him at base speed, and he'll just demolish people. He's just literally like a casino character. If he dodges a lot, he's just going to win every matchup pretty much no matter what. His accompanying artifact, Violet Talisman, has some usage. It's decent on him, but I think you'd rather play Moonlight Dreamblade. Uh, there's definitely other characters I've seen take advantage of Violet Talisman. I've seen like Closer Charles or even like Green Sid take advantage of Violet Talisman uh, in the past. So it's not a terrible artifact, just not exactly the best artifact either. Still Violet, pretty good character to have in your back pocket. Next up is Euphine. Uh, they changed her. She's still okay in Expeditions, which is where she primarily used to be, but she's not exactly the greatest anymore. The primary reason you'd want a player is you're a huge fan of her and you have Zeo. She pairs incredibly well in a lot of aggressive strategies alongside Zeo because now she kind of destroys people that are silenced. So that's super good. You could play her for that reason if you really wanted to. The main reason I have her where she's at is because her accompanying artifact is Merciless Glutton, which is incredibly good on a lot of single target warriors. You could use it on something like Zahak if you decide to not use a symbol of unity on him. Maybe your symbol is on somebody like Last Rider Crow after his buffs. Merciless Glutton is a very strong warrior artifact, but it's not exactly the most popular one. Like how we talked with Luna, Draco Plate is very good. There are some replacements. Merciless Glutton, that's one of those replacements. Next up, we have Yulha, who's the character I'll be releasing a guide for in the next day or so. She is a variant of Crow. She is very, very good. I think if you're a turn two player, you definitely should pick Yulha up. She is a great character. I think the thing, the reason why I have her here is because her accompanying artifact, which is Sphere of Sadism, not really a whole heck of a lot of users for it. I think it's like Yulha and like maybe one other one. It's not exactly the best. I'm not a super big fan of it. Still, Character you probably should have if you are a turn two player. Very good in Guild War offense. Super great in PvP if you're playing against dodge based characters. Next up is Ludwig, which I wanted to originally put in niche because I really don't like this character. I feel like he's propped up by the fact that the people who are playing him have just insane gear that most of the player base does not have access to. I just think that most people are really not going to be able to bring this character to his fullest potential. He's basically a cleave character only in certain PvP strategies. His accompanying artifact is Time Matter, 
which is actually really good. It's super good for Vivian in things like Asimatic 13 Hunt, so it has PvE applications, and it's, in my opinion, the best option for a damage-based Zeo in the entire game. So there's definitely a lot of use uh, on Time Matter after it's changed, it's definitely got a big come up, and I think Time Matter is the main reason to choose this character. Next up is Seaside Bologna. Uh, I don't really think she's anywhere near as good as she used to be. The game has kind of been power creeped a lot. Also, we got Lone Crest on Bologna, which, in my opinion, is just a better PvP version of the character, which kind of really relegates this limited character to Wyvern 13. If you're looking to maximize your Wyvern 13 team, get a one shot under your belt. Then definitely, definitely consider Seaside Bologna. But outside of Wyvern 13 and taking her alongside Lone Crescent Bologna into somebody like Bellion in World Arena, I really don't see the reason to play the character anymore. Her accompanying artifact is going to be the Rheingar Specialty Drink, which is still a fairly good artifact, although it's only really used on Seaside Bologna. Um, I probably would get a copy of Seaside Bologna and then look into getting. Uh, otherworldly machinery from the book of memories rather than go full send and try and max out a drink for your wyvern 13 one shot uh kind of usage but if you still want that option and you have money and resources to blow you absolutely could choose seaside bologna and get a plus 30 drink to make that wyvern 13 one shot a reality next up is tywin i have not seen too much of tywin post rework the games i have seen He's absolutely dominated, but I don't really see him a whole heck of a lot. In my eyes, I think he is a very good character. I just, again, I don't have any evidence to actually pro prove that, basically. I just, I've only seen him on paper and like, you know, two or three sample games where he just absolutely crushed. That's not enough for me to put him in great character. That said, his accompanying artifact is Crown of Glory, which did get reworked and has been fairly decent against aggressive strategies, especially if you own Last Rider Crow. Next up is Zahak, very well positioned character in the format if you are more of an aggressive player. Super good against dodge based characters like Savior Auden, as well as Remnant Violet. Has good Guild War offense applications as well, especially if you have Zeo. So. Definitely very strong PvP character if you like to play aggressively. His accompanying artifact, Pure White Trust, is not super great. It's pretty much just a worse version of Red Sermia's Border Coin. Uh, so I can't really recommend him for that. Great character. Hard to recommend going any higher on the tier list because you only really need one copy and the artifact is just not there. Similar story here with Para, who should be with the blue characters, but apparently I guess I just assumed she was green. Uh, Para's actually really well positioned right now in the current meta. She is, you know, probably the best character for you slower players to put all your speed gear on. She's one of the best speed contesters. I play mine over 300 speed. She's pretty much my go-to speed contester in the 3 to 5 slot. A lot of disruptions, stuns, doubles as mitigation. So aggressive drafts might not be able to ban out my mitigation. They might call my bluff and be like, maybe the pair is really not that fast. So that's really, really nice as well. Attack buff for the team. Just very well-positioned character in the later portions of the draft in the current format. Her accompanying artifact, Goblet of Oath, is not as good as RNL on her, but I still think Goblet of Oath is one of the best options on Para in general. It is still a good artifact on her. Again, you don't really need a ton of copies of Goblet of Oath, though, because only really Para is using it, and you only really need one copy of her, which is why she's not higher. Next up is Irvalen, who I feel very similarly about uh, Ludwig. I don't think this character is that good. I think that the players who are playing him just have really insane gear and are just gear gapping uh, the people that they're playing with Irvalen. He's not really super great, I feel like, in almost anything except for those like meme aggressive drafts you see in PvP. The main reason he is here is for his accompanying artifact, Double-Edged Crescent, which is probably the best in slot artifact for Kron and is good on a slew of other characters. You can use it on things like Remnant Violet, for example. Um, I might choose Irvalon from this thing because I don't have Double Edge to Crescent. It really is that important for Kron. So yeah, that's the primary reason he's here. Moving on to niche characters or artifacts. We're going to start off with Hua Young, a character I absolutely love in the story and I love her character design. But man, that those nerfs, they, they just crushed this girl. I didn't think that they would be... I knew they would be a little bit overkill, but they massively over nerfed this character. Um, she needed to be nerfed from where she was. But 
Now she's just like unplayable. The main reason I have her here is for Indestructible Gators, which is her accompanying artifact. It is a best in slot option for certain characters like Inferno Kawazu, for example. And that's a character that really wants to have access to this artifact. So if you are super keen on playing Inferno Kawazu in PvP strategies, if you really like using him on Guild War offense, Hua Yang to get that artifact is probably something you might want to consider. Next up is Ball and Cezanne. Last Tea Time is not really an artifact I want to write home about. Only real reason he is here under niche is that he's the best red expedition character in the game alongside red Cecilia. And for you PvE purists that are trying to min-max the account, that accounts for something. For me, I really want to have the best uh, PvE characters that I can for the various different hunts the various different expeditions, and to me, Ball and Cezanne is irreplaceable for Blooming Stagnant, which, which is why I put him there. He also has value in imprints for Sage Ball and Cezanne, if you pull extras. Next up, we have Melissa here. Melissa is, I think, nerfed after her most recent round of boss. I don't really see her as much, but I decided to play it safe, put her in niche character, because... She was really popular for a minute there for aggressive and cleave strategies. That might not necessarily be the case. I'm not necessarily an aggressive uh, player. But yeah, for those aggressive PvP strategies, she was viable at one point. Her accompanying artifact, which is Bloody Rose, is decent for Zeo. If you're going effectiveness-based Zeo, it's probably his best in slot option. So that's why I have her here. Next up, we have Red Ken. Super great in Ancient Inheritance. His reworked artifact, Samsara Prayer Beads, has been seeing usage on characters like Dark Corvus and Apocalypse Ravi, who are meta pick characters. So that is why he is here. Blue Chloe, Little, um, Little Queen's Huge Crown, has some niche applications. She's also integral to certain Banshee 13 one-shot compositions. She kind of minimizes the RNG, makes it so that you have a 100% clear that's why she's here you're only really playing the character in those super late game high investment hunt teams pavel is a fan favorite for aggressive strategies but i feel like he's kind of lost his place with the advent of architect Leica. you could take him for a spin as long as you have a mage on your team with ancient book in pvp strategies nowadays he's pretty much the best banshee 13 character in the game for one shotting him in tandem with blue chloe is going to give you that 100% uh, kind of clear rate with no actual RNG. His accompanying artifact, Do Noctis, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, is not good, I feel like, on almost anyone. So you're only really choosing him if you want Commander Pavel imprints or you're really looking for that Banshee 13 one shot. Next up, we have Mort, who I don't particularly think is a super great character, but every once in a while you'll see a Legend or Emperor player kind of pop off with him. So he can't be as bad as I think he is. The main reason to choose him is for Ancient Dragon's Legacy, which recently got reworked and is super good on Red Lilius. Command Model Laika, another speed contest character. I don't think she's as good as a lot of other speed contesters. People have kind of figured out her gimmick that Rimuru counters her if you are on Guiding Light. So a lot of people who play Laika have gone off of Guiding Light, which opens you up to so many other things. So she's not as good as she used to be, but if you're looking for another speed contester, another speed demon character, she's pretty good, does a lot. Her accompanying artifact, which is Glow Wings, also has some really awkward tech. Uh, you can ask somebody like Call888 for how that actually works. Uh, I'm not too sure on the specifics, but I know that Glow Wings has been kind of like a niche tech that some of the high-level players have been using in PvP. Mui is next. Had a rework slash set of buffs. Haven't really seen anything from her. The only reason that I decided to put her in niche is because Circus Fantasia is her actual artifact. And if you were playing Conqueror Lilius and you don't really want to go for Champions Trophy for whatever reason, Circus Fantasia is super good on that character. That's why I put her in here. Then we have Flan here at the end. Apparently, I guess I can't determine which characters are blue and green. I must be like colorblind. Uh, excellent aggressive character for cleave strategies if you have really high speed gear you like to play very fast very aggressively absolute staple i feel like for those kinds of play styles her accompanying artifact which is unforeseen observer is super good on her as well but that's kind of it she's kind of self-contained only her artifact really works on her and again you're going to probably need some premium speed gear to really get the most out of this character which i don't think everybody will actually have 
All right, whew. Let's go on to don't pulls for now. Uh, Araminta, not super good anywhere outside of raid. Accompanying artifact Etika Scepter is good, but there are better mage options. Bomb Model Kata is free for all players. The only reason to take her is her accompanying artifact Misha, which is only really used on a specific Moonlight 5-star character in Briar Cesaria. As far as I know, that is too niche for me to recommend it. Red Tenebria, if you wanted imprints, take Fairy Tale Tenebria because it's a limited with a limited artifact. Her artifact that accompanies it which is the uh extra one that i forget the name of it at the moment it escapes me it's the crimson moon one that gives dual attack chance that one is super niche and not super playable anywhere only real use for red tenebria i feel like currently at the moment is in very very specific abyss floors but that's too niche for me to really recommend it red lytica is decent for aggressive strategies but i think there's almost always a better option like i've said with like ludwig or or Valen in the past only really used in like one, maybe two Abyss Floors. Again, super niche. Her artifact is also super niche. Only really use it for like Hall of Trials and nothing else. Uh, Blue Lulica, good in a lot of PvE content. Abyss and things like that. That said, her accompanying artifact, I'm not super keen on. Spirit's Breath, it's only good on like Angel Light, Angelica. And I think I'd rather play Book most of the time. Like, Lulica is just in a really weird spot because every time I think she's, like, the optimal choice, there's always another option you could take that would end up being better. It's just, again, really hard to recommend her. And then her accompanying artifact only really has, like, one user. And there's at least, like, two or three other options you could take over that. Uh, Teyu, only really good in, like, one RTA matchup in the game. Into Arya has an okay matchup, I feel like. Into Pirate Captain Flam, but the smart players can absolutely play around it. Accompanying artifact spirit purification. I just really haven't found a home for it outside of Teyu himself. It really just feels like it misses the mark. Lilibet only really good in like Guild War offense, and even then there's a million other better options. I feel like and then her her accompanying artifact, which is creation and destruction, is also super not good as well. Aronka really needs damage multiplier buffs. Super niche, really not worth the investment. I feel like it. Her artifact that accompanies it is only really good on like Kitty Clarissa and Expeditions. You don't want to waste uh, your valuable resources to get something like that uh, for just like one very niche thing that has other comparable better options like say Memorandum, which is a three-star artifact. Sharoon, really not that good. Death Deal Array is so much better than this character is for the Venom strategy. Her artifact is also like insanely niche, like only Inos. 2.0 really wants to play the damn thing and it's not even super great there uh ray i debated moving up a tier he really needs buffs he's really super not that good right now he's a cleanser in a world with mediator quirk designer lilibet and destina running around so he's just never gonna have any chance to shine anywhere his accompanying artifact is doctor's bag which is only really super decent on like two characters so again not enough for me to recommend him Green Charles, decent character for hunts, but other than that, his accompanying artifact, Justice for All, not really used on anybody because Clurry is not really meta. There's not really anyone else to use it on. Uh, I just think there are better uses of your bookmarks. Green Bologna, another hunt-only specific character, but there are other characters that you can use in her place. She's not like mandatory. It's not like Vivian. Vivian is like super good, can be used almost everywhere. Uh, lots of flexibility uh, and whatnot. Bologna's really only for like Asimatic 13. Charles only really for like Asimatic 13 and or uh, Banshee if you just have really, really cracked gear. So that's why I can't recommend it. Accompanying Artifact, Iron Fan, not really used anywhere outside of Pavel for Banshee 13 one shot if you have insane gear. So yeah, again, really hard to recommend this one. And then these are the not availables as far as I know. Summer Break Charlotte has not come back yet. Uh, if she was available... Uh, in this thing, I would probably rate her as a great character and or artifacts you want lots of copies of because her accompanying artifact, Mature Sunglasses, is super good on characters like Ilanav and Bellion. So you definitely are going to want to have a lot of copies of that thing. Bihu probably would put in good character. I think he uh, had a pretty decent showing at the Zodiac Cup. Kind of proved that the character is decent. He's not as bad as people thought he was. I thought this character was pretty hype when he actually came out. I'm sad that not more people are actually making use of him. Decent character. His actual artifacts is decent on him, but I probably wouldn't really play it elsewhere. Elegos, I think, is probably I would put under uh, a uh, good character in uh, pretty much in the same vein as some of the other ones. I think that the character is actually great, but 
most people who are playing the game don't have the gear to actually bring him to his fullest potential. I feel like a lot of the Asia server whales will you know, run wild with him uh, in aggressive strategies when we finally see that in various different tournaments. His accompanying artifact just feels very weak compared to Guiding Light or even like Sasha of Thanes, which is I think those are the two major factors why I would put him into great character uh, for most of you watching this video. And then finally, Ahmed. If Ahmed was actually a, a choice, I would choose Godlike character because the character pretty much defines most of the aggressive play styles that we are seeing on ladder. Um, and she has the ability to pivot into standard if she so chooses, even though she's not super optimal there. Her accompanying artifact is super insane on her and you want to have it plus 30 if you absolutely can. Whew. All right, there we go. Another one of these in the books. Super long. Hopefully you enjoyed it. If I missed anything, made any mistakes, as always, let me know down in the comments below. Tune in later on this week. I will be dropping how to play Yulha. I will try very hard also to put out a couple more guides in the very near future. So stay tuned. Thank you all so much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your day, the rest of your week, and I'll catch you all later. Bye-bye now.